you know, there's something my keyboard is touch that helps me to ascend. These guys don't have keyboard, this and the rest. But they have one thing called faith. Yes. Faith doesn't respect circumstance. If, we, if they met us, even in this church here, and it was their time of prayer, they will, they will, they will pray there. Now, this example is to show us that true worship is not affected by environment. If you are ever devoted to prayer, if you like being in a board meeting, in an office meeting, your colleagues should learn to respect your faith, not the other way around. Are we together? Hey, are, we, are we together? Oh, but you know, pastor, the Bible says wisdom is profitable to direct. See, that scripture does not apply to relationship with God. In fact, in your relationship with God, it is wisdom to stand with God. The Bible says the fear of God. What do you think the fear of God is? If you truly fear God, you will put him first. You know that this being is, I don't have time. We would talk about worship one of these days. I'm going to show you from the Bible what worship is. You now discover that when I talk, a lot of people get offended. But I won't stop saying the truth, according to scripture. You now defend that, you now discover that a lot of things we do, sadly, is not worship. The people worshiping God, God give us help in Yeshua's name. So true worship is not affected by environment. True worship is not forced. True worship is a product of someone's faith and revelation. I've always thought this. If you want to know a man that has seen God, look at him when he worships. If you want to know a man that fears God, look at him, look at how he approaches the presence of God. Reverence is not forced. Reverence is understood. If a man understands the value of God in his life, he doesn't need any friend around him to motivate him to reverence God. Any reverence that is motivated is false. True reverence comes from the place of faith and revelation. A man has seen it. So he understands to bow to the being he has seen. False that being is immortal, greater than the one that can kill his body. But after that, cannot do anything. Many times you see me, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my seat and go and play the conga. There is no celebrity in church. We only have worshippers. When, when we now find celebrities in church, we've come to August meeting. Are we together? We've not come to the gathering of saints. That one is August meeting. That's where you find celebrities. But you see, in the household of God, you find worshippers. Worshippers are people of faith and revelation. So let's say you are a skilled drummer here and then you come into the church and then they don't have a drummer and they are worshipping God. It's only an erroneous setting that will deprive you from having access to the drum if it will aid in the worship of God among the people. Are we together? So this is why this is what makes worship pure. I, I'm a worshiper. So I'm telling you the secret I've learned in the room of light. I've been worshiping God for many years. And I can tell you that there are incense. You know, I've described to you how worship looks like in this. It's like smoke. As it rises unto God, you rise with the smoke. What you call ascension is you rising with what you're offering. Because it's through the eternal spirit you offer sacrifice unto God. So as the sacrifice rise, through the eternal spirit, you also rise with the sacrifice. Until at some point, you will now discover that you are no longer in Musetu. You are now in Salem. You are now in a location in the spirit with innumerable company of angels worshipping God. If work activity can actually dis distract you from worship, then what you call faith is not there. Now, I don't care who tries to bend the scriptures to lie to you. I don't care who you are. If activity... For example, now we have engineers working on the lights. Now, if I'm a Christian among them, and I'm in church, and after arranging my light, I can, I'm distracted. So, oh, I just came here to work. Then I'm telling you that I've become fake. I'm giving you a practice. If I'm an engineer now, I say, okay, go to this place and set up. And after I set up, I, I'm a Christian. So, these are my brethren gathering. Let me also join. And I'm conscious of the worship. If I cannot have that mentality as a believer, then guess what? My worship is false. It's man-made. It has nothing to do with eternity. Yes. It has nothing to do with eternity. 
I'm telling you the truth of the matter. So a lot of times, a lot of us has to repent because we've been trained wrongly. Sadly, we've been trained wrongly. To understand the presence of God. You have two prisoners who are Christians worshiping God in the prison. And if you read that scripture, you'll find out that the Bible says where they were was shaken. There was an earthquake there. Prison doors were open. It was a sign to the unbelievers there. There, there was a great revival in that place. Because two prisoners gave true worship unto their God. Guess what? True worship bets revival, it bets salvation. If a worship is ever genuine, you don't need to say there's a fire here, revival will be better. It cannot be a spiritual fruit if it's not in spirit. And if it's in spirit, it will be offered by the eternal spirit. Lastly, before I sing a song and then they continue, lastly, whenever you approach the presence of God, always have it as a consciousness in your spirit that God is spirit. God is spirit. Your dress doesn't matter in what we are talking about, even though it's good to dress fine. The person you are owing or that is owing you doesn't matter. The money that you are expecting that has not come doesn't matter. In fact, the infirmity in your body doesn't matter. I was studying the scripture this morning and I found in the book of Luke, in, during the temptation of Jesus, Yeshua told him, if, I mean, Satan told Yeshua, if you are the son of God, make stone into bread. Yeshua, um, the devil also told him, you were at the pinnacle of the temple, jump down from here, if you are the son of God. But most importantly, the devil now also told him that, when the devil took him to a high mountain, the devil told him that, look at the kingdoms of the world and the glory. All these things have been given to me. And I can give to anyone I will. So Satan was simply telling Jesus that in this world I have power to lift men. I have power to change people's life. You know, we preach a gospel and we tell people that Jesus can make you poor, from poor, you can become rich. Yes, it's possible. But Satan too can do that. Satan said that these things are equal, sir. You see, when you see princes speaking in the Bible, I, this was Satan. Oh, one of the signs that you are a Christian is that you are going to be a kingdom man. Satan is also a kingdom spirit. Some pastors came to see me and I was giving a spiritual lecture. I said, if Satan appears to you now, what do you think he will teach you? He will teach you heavenly things because he also fell from heaven. That is his origin. He will not teach you anything apart from the things that are of heaven. This is why whenever we spoke of heaven in scriptures... We had to narrow it down to where Christ is seated. Because there are so many princes seated in the heavens. So if what you glorify are things that come from above, obviously, if you are not careful, you may bow to a spirit that also came from above, but not where Christ is seated. So guess what? Satan handled kingdoms too. The Bible said the kingdoms of this world and his glory. So in Satan to his glory, he was showing you that how, just as you say to Jesus, be the kingdoms, the power and the glory to him to be the kingdoms of men, the power and the glory. So he said, I have the kingdoms of men, I have his glory and I have the authority to will it to anyone I want. He said, I can do these things for you if you will bow down to worship me. You know, one of the gifts God has given me as a prophet is that I see the Bible through the lens he wants me to see. So I don't just see the Bible, I see it from his eyes. When I was looking at that, he told me something very clear. He said, what you are seeing here is circumstantial worship. Worship that is an offspring of blessing. Satan said, bow and worship me and I will what? Give to you. So you see, you see a circumstantial type of worship that is transaction based. So a lot of people come to, I go see Lamanai. Can I speak, sir? You know, come to church and say, oh, I have to worship God so that I can get a job. Whenever worship becomes transactional, you may be bowing to Lucifer. Yes. 
Now look at Yeshua's answer. He said, get behind me, Satan. For you shall worship. He didn't say you shall worship the Lord your God so that we bless you. Whether I'm dying, I shall worship the Lord my God and only him shall I serve. It has nothing to do with what he's withholding or what he's giving to me. Yeshua never tied worship to anything in the circumstance. This is why you cannot be distracted by environment. If you would offer true worship by the eternal spirit unto God, whether you are poor like Lazarus, whether God has not answered your tithe, ah, yeah, your tithe and your offering, you stand as one who is a witness unto the faithfulness of the immortal God. And just in case you die in that problem, your blood becomes a witness. That a man walked with God. Flee from the error of the circumstantial worship that has drowned our generation in despair. So many Christians come to God with a heavy heart. Why? Their transaction has not cleared. And they don't know that spiritual worship has nothing to do with what God can give me. What, you see, there's a song back in those days I used to like. Um, Look what you've done for me, my God. Uh, what can I do for you, my Lord? I am. I know Mosina. I want you to know my heart is yours. Yahweh, Yahweh, look what you've done for me. There's a part in that song I love. He goes to say, it's not a question of what you can do for me. But what can I do? I, oh my God. Even as a young man, when I heard those songs, I would begin to cry. He said, it's not a question of what you can do. What can I do for you?